Number one today is Thursday, February 18, 2016, and this is the week in charts. And it's not a dramatic pause in case you were wondering. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm waiting on my slides to come up. Yeah. While waiting on that, this is a, I did a redesign of my website, so you guys uh, check it out. And also, one thing we'll be talking about today, I just did an example on uh, adding a layer of discretion. So I'm going to be doing a little bit more updates and keeping things a lot more current uh, with the new site. So check it out uh, after the show, of course. <laughs> You love the Moses picture. Thank you, RJ. <laughs> okay, I don't know why the slides are not coming up. Sound is good. Fantastic. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Joe. Morning, Joe. I'm so pumped at what's set, setting up in the market. What's setting up? You mean the next, uh, the next pullback? Okay. Yeah, give me one second. I'm sorry about this. Ah, here we go. Finally. Jeez. Yeah, there's some shorts that are setting up nicely in this pullback while we're waiting on these um, charts to load. In fact, we could um, – here we go. I guess we'll edit this out. And, um... All right. Fantastic. Okay, uh, we have a sponsor this week, and if you guys were here last week, you'll know that it's going to be Barking Squirrel Coffee Roasters. And I wasn't sure what a barking squirrel was at first. I knew it, uh, I knew it wasn't a barking spider, which is something completely different. But uh, I read this little story on the website. It was kind of interesting. So it's BarkingSquirrelCoffee.com. So check that out. And you know what? It's also brought to you by me and specifically my trading service and uh, i kind of like this graphic i think it's kind of fun and cool and it's pretty much uh, what the market's been like so far this year so check that out if you get a chance and um, i have a delayed service which i'll show you towards the end of the presentation and you could follow along with the delayed service um, in fact if you're newer to trading or newer to my methodology or if you don't have a lot of money but you do want to learn you know even if you don't have money you should start learning because this is going to be for the rest of your life and that's one thing that I'm going to start really working on is Trader for Life. Uh, anyway, there's a disclaimer screen, and as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Um, I want to continue with my not made to trade. I almost said diatribe because some, some somebody said um, I was doing a psychological diatribe last week, but I want to continue on with that theme, and this is based on an email I received, and it got me to thinking, we're just, we're just not made to trade, and we have to overcome that, and when faced with adversity, we react, and then I got to thinking about this morning, and that's pretty much what keeps us alive. We, we work to get out of danger. You know, it's like my teenage daughter. She's a pretty good driver. She's, she hasn't got her license yet. It's going to be a few weeks, but... Uh, we're, we're, you know, in the final phases of getting her ready for that, and she took a ride on red, which is perfectly legal, Louisiana, but she forgot to look at that possibly the cars coming from across the intersection could uh, could just nail us. And so, you know, obviously I had a reaction to that. You have to have a reaction. You know, of course, my reaction was screaming, but in life, you have to have a reaction. You have to get out the way of danger. But in trading, what do you do? Well, you need to follow your plan, at least more often than not. But we find these urges to do something. We have to do something. We have to take action because in life, we either take action to be successful or avoid pain or some sort of danger. So this is the email I got. Stayed in MOH, which seems good now to use a little discretion. Looks like. The stop should be placed at 60-ish to see if I could stay in the trend. Well, there's a difference between discretion and micromanaging. Micromanaging is not following the plan and trying to 
to get out of harm's way because you think that the move might be done or some sort of logic or reasoning. And again, this comes back to we're not made to trade. In life, everything you do should be approached with a high degree of logic and reasoning. So this is micromanaging when you're not following the plan. Now, here's the plan. The stop is at it's 62. So the stop's right here. So the, the question is, do we just get out right here? Because look, it's rallied up quite a bit. And the answer is no. Let the stop get taken out because this marginal increase in a possible loss doesn't save you that much money. In fact, if we look at that, based on the, and again, this is on a hypothetical $100,000 account. I don't know if I said that uh, this so far today, but so based on that account, you'd have 150 shares left over. So if you got out now and saved those two points, you would save $300. But if you look at a weekly chart, I think this stock has the potential to possibly go down to the 30s. So if it did that, that's about 20 or 20 something points from where we are now. So let's just say it did uh, 20 points, okay? Well, 20 times 150 is $3,000. So this marginal additional loss, it obviously there's some caveats, a gap or something could, could muck that out thing all up, but this marginal additional loss is not that significant in the bigger scheme of things. So you want to keep your eyes on the prize. And the real money is in the longer term moves and longer term trades. Now, the beauty is if you get stopped out, then you're still going to be getting stopped out at a profit. 66 minus 62, you're going to make four points in the trade. Well, that's better than the poke in the eye. And you can't, in the end, it's going in badly. As I say, on every trade, like George Carlin says, when you buy a pet, I know somebody said a parrot last week, but there's always one in a group. Uh, <laughs> good point, point taken. Um, it's going in badly. You're either going to lose it a trade, okay, or you're going to make money, and then in the end, you're going to give up some money, okay? You're, you're rarely, if ever, going to get it exactly right, maybe once or twice in your career. Once you become a trend follower, you give up trying, and that's the beauty of being a trend follower. You just follow along. I know, easier said than done. Last night, again, I was hanging out with my daughter, and we went to uh, the used bookstore. She likes to kind of hang out there because it's a quirky little place. And so we had dinner, and we went, hung out there for a little while. My wife was off with her friends. So it was kind of like, you know, it, every now and then we go hang out and do this. And, and I picked up a book of all things on Russian proverbs. And I was thinking to myself, okay, Dave, why do you need a book on Russian proverbs? And it just kind of, it, it just kind of caught my eye for some reason, maybe because I was went to Russia a while back and there was a few little uh, quotes and things I heard there, which were kind of interesting. And the first one, I just opened the book up to see if I wanted to buy it or not. And the first thing, I read the first proverb I read, it says, your elbow is near. Your elbow is near, but try to bite it, okay? So I wonder how many of you right now are trying to bite your elbow, okay? It's kind of like, you know, this morning I woke up and said, well, let me try to bite my elbow. And it's sort of a, I thought it was an interesting proverb, but I said, I got to have this. It, just for that one proverb alone, it's worth it. So, and I often say, all you have to do, it's kind of like my wife, it's, it's like, oh, come on, Dave, can you fix this little pl plumbing problem? All you have to do is tighten it up a little bit, okay? Well, that turns into a much bigger deal. So on the surface, things often seem a lot simpler than they really are. But in trading, they really aren't. But the problem is, it's your thought process and the fact that we're not really made to trade. You're trying to figure out a way 
to micromanage that trade. Now, there's a big difference between micromanaging and using a little bit of discretion. And I'm going to flesh that out in just one second. So I'm showing this little incremental risk of waiting for that stop to get hit. Now, I probably shouldn't say waiting for the stop to get hit, but let's just say if the stop gets hit, okay? So you have an incremental risk of a couple of points, which is $300 per 100K. But there's a potential for $3,000 or maybe even more. So if we just go back to where we were in 2014, and seriously, what's, you know, I don't want to get into fundamentals or anything, but has anything really changed? Is the company vastly different now than it was six, eight months ago? I don't know. But when I, whenever I look at a chart, I always think, where is it now? Where was it six months ago or a year ago? Could it go back to where it was a year ago? And on the flip side, if I'm looking at a, a, a bow tie or some kind of first thrust or emerging trend pattern, Phoenix or something, the Phoenix pattern coming off of major lows, I look at where the stock was a year or two ago and say, well, maybe this company has reinvented itself and it could get back to those old highs. So maybe it could do that. So that's the potential that I see. Now, let me interview myself. Will it really make 20 points? Probably not. Will you likely save $2 by getting out early? Probably. Okay. More often than not, micromanagement pays off. But here's the dilemma. You easily end up tripping over the nickels while going for the dollars. Okay. And a lot of people get caught up in that. I think we're, again, we're not made to trade. I think we are sort of programmed not to just, for lack of a better word, piss money away. So you're going to piss $300 away by letting that stop get hit. Well, so what? You're following a plan, and you have to keep your eyes on the prize and follow that plan versus micromanage yourself out of a trade. So be careful not to trip over the nickels while going for the dollars. Unfortunately, the market is a really bad teacher. It's going to teach you to get out of the trade, get out of the trade, get out of the trade, get out of the trade. And then that fifth time, or maybe the tenth time, or maybe even the twentieth time, that you get out of the trade to save a few nickels and you start patting yourself on the back. The next day, that stock on the short side is halved in value or the next day that stock gets bought out or the mother of all trends somehow begins to develop. Bought out on the long side, obviously not on the short side. You don't want that to happen. But you get my point, and I've seen it quite a bit throughout my career, and I get emails from people, Dave, we're short this stock. The market is up. I'm sorry. We're short the stock. The market is down. This stock is up. Something's wrong. It should be doing this. Well, that's where you're interjecting logic into the equation again. Okay. Yeah, ideally it should be following the market, but sometimes stocks can trade a little bit independently of the market. And then what happens the following day, they get out. And, of course, the following day, this was a short, the, the stock implodes. It was NBIX years ago. I remember that trade very specifically. It was a fantastic trade. And so that one big trade could make up for a lot of trades. And one thing I was thinking about this morning, even if that only happens once every few years, and this is where sometimes it could be a little elusive, and that's that's the tough part. Last week we talked a lot about how people cannot – tough it out, so to speak, until they get the good times. Well, you're going to have to tough it out on a lot of little trades that have those incremental losses. But if you keep your eye on the prize, sooner or later, you're going to capture that big trade. And that big trade, and I was thinking about this morning, it's not only going to make a year if it's really big, but it could make several years and make all the difference in the world. So remember that the market is a really bad teacher often a bad teacher and it's going to often 
tell you to do the wrong thing. Now, wait, Dave, I thought you said use discretionary trading. Well, no, you want to follow the plan. Not following the plan is micromanagement. Discretion is different. I'm glad you asked. So discretion is saying, okay, we're going to get in at X, but the market is really close to that level. So we had an entry like right here coming into today, and the stock closed right here. So I told my peeps last night, okay, guys, this entry is so close, it's more than likely to get hit on the open. And what I mean by that, on noise alone, and a market maker, and he's got to feed his family too, so I don't, I don't get pissed off at market makers anymore. But a market maker might say, hey, I think I could bump this stock up a little bit. I'm going to suck in those pullback players that had the entry just above that high, and then I'm going to spit them out, make a little money. Kids are hungry, okay? So let's take a look at what happens intraday. So instead of using that original entry, because you know there's a pretty good chance it's going to hit, get hit on the open or on a fast move on the open. Then what you do is let the stock open up and see what happens. And then if the stock begins to come back in, then you put in a new entry above that intraday high. So in this case, I forget exactly how many cents it would be. Maybe six cents higher would be your new entry than the stock implodes. And sometimes... Using discretion can help you avoid a losing trade altogether, okay? The other time you might use discretion is you're within a few cents of a profit target, okay? Let's just imagine that in this particular case. Let's say we were already long this stock, and then our profit target was right here, and it rallied up to about right there. It's like it's okay to take profits a little earlier. Because we're just looking, that's initial profits. We're just looking for a small piece of that first half. We're not micromanaging ourselves out of a huge gain because we have a finite gain in mind. Remember, we're looking for 1% on the first loaf and hopefully some large percentage on the remaining shares. Okay, So notice how this is right about 1% on the first loaf. Okay. We're looking for eight points on the first look. We're risking eight points, looking for eight points. One to one. I have a couple of videos out there on why this is not a negative expectancy. So watch them if you get a chance out on YouTube. But the reason it is is because hopefully this number here, this longer term trend following position, becomes many times that one for one. It becomes many times to one, not many times one for one, many times that. And so far, Maybe it's not, but again, keep your eye on the prize. This is where the real money is, and if it stops out, so what? You stop at it again, better than poking the eye, and you know, as I often say, if it pisses you off that you gave up open profits, mail me all the profits, Dave Landry uh, or Cynthia Trading Company, uh, LLC, CO, Dave Landry, P.O. Box 298, Abita Springs, Louisiana, 70420. Send me all those profits and then go center yourself. Go meditate and, and forget about that trade altogether. Now, I've been saying this for, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, maybe more. I haven't gotten any <laughs> received any money in my box from a, from a trade that ended by giving up a little bit of those open profits. So it's okay. So the difference between micromanaging and discretion is – Discretion is using your head to possibly get into a trade, to possibly take profits a little bit early if the market just can't seem to get to that profit target, or if it gets there quickly, near there quickly, and you're worried that it might have got there too quickly, okay, because the market might be over, already overbought. So it's okay to take profits a little bit early. But make sure that whatever you do, discretionary-wise, you're still allowing yourself to possibly capture that longer-term gain. Remember, 
the ultimate goal is to limit losses and have the potential for unlimited gains. You can trade a system that does just the opposite, and you can look like a genius, and you might look like a genius for a long time. In other words, and it's a so-called anthill strategy, you can trade a little or a so-called income-producing strategy. If you hear anyone ever say, this is an income-producing strategy, the first thing you need to do is run. Okay, let's go back to that flight of fight human thing that we have. Yes, in that case, you want to run, not walk away from that because there is no such thing. Go back and read Reminiscence of a Stock Operator by Jesse Livermore. I recommend that book quite often. And he says just that, that the chap that expects a regular paycheck for from the market is going to be uh, very disappointed. It, it just doesn't work that way, okay? And the so-called income-producing strategies, mean reversion, selling options, things like that. Now, if you do that and you're successful, then that's fine, but just make sure you don't have that open-ended loss out there because the true mean reversion people will tell you that you can't, t you can't take that loss. You have to – you don't use stops, blah, blah, blah. But if you are trading something that does just the opposite of – Limited losses and unlimited gains, so limited gains and unlimited losses. Sooner or later, something bad will happen to you. Um, read Tlaib's book, okay, The Black Swan Thing. So you always have to keep your eye on the prize. And what is the, what is the prize? The prize is a bigger picture, longer-term trend. Okay, lots of questions coming in. Fantastic. Um Phil says, waiting to see if it goes through stop and keeps going. When do you pull the trigger then? Well, it depends. So let's say it does rally up and go through the stop. First of all, if you're not disciplined, then you know what you do? You let that stop get hit and you say, hey, I, I made, I still made a little money on the trade, on the second loaf of the trade. And again, if it pisses you off, feel free to send it to me, okay? But let the stop get hit and get out if you're not disciplined. If you are disciplined and, you know, the overall market's rallying up and market's kind of losing a little steam and kind of rolling over again, if you want to use a little discretion, then you could say, okay, well, looks like it's going to hit it, and let me just kind of see what happens, but then have some sort of uncle point in mind. In a case like this, when it made it all the way down here, and your stop is way up here as a gentle state, but you probably want to let it just get hit. Now, let's say that it doesn't get hit today and the stock closes right here, okay? Now, that's a damage control or just not necessarily a damage control, but a discretionary call because tomorrow, more likely than not, it will open up at least slightly above that stop or right at that stop. So in that particular case, it's like, okay, well, let me let it open. Let's see what happens. And if it begins to come back in, then I put my stop back in above that range, okay? It's kind of the same thing we did on the entry, but it would be like on the stop. So let's just imagine that we were short this market. If I could find it. Okay. So if we were short this market and our stop was here, okay, and we knew the market was right here. Now, this looks a lot bigger than it is. This is only a few cents. But we knew that market had a chance to hit that stop on the open. So we watch it get hit. Now, it does take discipline, okay? If it keeps going, you have to have an uncle point in mind. But if it just kind of comes up, hits the stop, and then rolls back over, then you put in that new stop right above that opening range. So that's where a little discretion comes in. Now, if you can't watch a screen, you could possibly put in a contingency order. I don't want to get too far into that. Every broker has different ones. And then I tried to help somebody once, and it's like, well, I'm not showing that in my account because they had a different level of account. So that's a can of worms I don't want to approach or get into. But read about them, study them, figure it out. Maybe you could say uh, it has to be bidding above that level, 
and it also has to have some trading volume at that level and a few other things, and that might help you if you can't watch a screen. Um, if you're newer to trading or lack and or lack discipline, you want to trade things a little bit more mechanically for a long time until you get comfortable with discretion, understand it, and also comfortable with yourself and you're able to, to make those trades using a little discretion. And if you can't use a discretion, again, I'll come back to those contingency orders. Maybe there's something you could do to where you could put that order in and let the market make the decision for you, okay? No, I'm in on the entry setup. CNX. So what's the question? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean about that. Can you re-ask? What if it goes through the stop? It keeps going. What do you do? When do you pull the trigger then? I'm not sure what you're asking. Okay. Yeah, rephrase, Phil, and I'll, I'll go back to you. All right, morning from Colorado. Morning, Steve. <laughs> Is the Kool-Aid character from the Family Guy? I don't know. I don't, I don't watch Family Guy. Um, whatever that guy's name is, though. Is that Seth Farland? He's funny as hell. Shorts are setting up nicely. Yeah, I agree, uh, Dathan. Almost textbook. Yeah, it does look good, doesn't it? Uh, question is, Dave, is your trailing stop ATR a base? Uh, Donald asked that. Uh, yes and no. Um, if you were try to if you would try to quali quantify the way I do stops, it would probably turn into an ATR. And if you want to use ATR to help you set stops, that's fine. But it's a little bit more advanced than I want to get into today. But my stops aren't exactly statistically based. I think statistically based stops could be a little bit too wide. But in a lot of cases, you'll mind looking at my stops and say, hey, they're kind of wide, Dave. What I do is I put them as wide as possible to hopefully ride out a short-term move in the markets. When I say as wide as possible, uh, as tight as possible, but still wide enough, I should say. Not as tight as possible, still wide enough to ride out a short-term move and not too wide where there'd be some obvious place where the tra trade would be a failure. And then as we transition from that short-term trader to longer-term trader, we begin to loosen that stop up. If you go to my website, go to the store, scroll down. I make you walk through the store, make you walk through the gift shop before you get to the free stuff. Uh, but if you scroll down to the bottom, you're going to see that there's a free reports. So click on the free reports and download, um, download the 21-page report. And that's gonna uh, that's gonna explain to you the methodology, the loosening stops, and things like that. In fact, if you just go to the webinar page now, if you go to webinar sign up and sign up for the webinar, even though you're already here, and I know that, but I just added a, I added that free report to the webinar page, so you can get that right away if you need it. Okay, Matt says, "Market is terrible. Teacher teaches you to be happy with small gains and forget the big losses." Yeah, I mean it's it's uh it's tough. And the tough part about trade following sometimes is chip away, chip away, chip away, and then you're like, oh, lose a little, make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little, lose a little, lose a little, lose a little. Jeez, I'm just, I'm out of here. Because you know what? We are, we're wired to avoid pain. We're not made to trade. So after X amount of losses in a row, even though you're doing the right thing, what happens? You quit, and then, of course, the market takes off. And that was the fodder for, I think, last week's presentation. And that's why we got off on this long psychological diatribe. It's it just – it's – with the first third of my career, or however you want to look at it, first tenth of my career, I was focused on setups, 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 patterns, 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 methods, methods, methods. And then the second – section of my career was money management, money management, money management. And now the third and final, I guess, <laughs> part of my career is, is psychology, psychology, psychology. So you need those, you need the methodology and, and, and all three are intertwined as I often say, 
but that methodology you have to has to be a sound one. It has to be a viable viable one. You have to believe in it. It has to, and I hate to say it, in my opinion, but it's like, well, can you give the opinion of others? No, Dave, <laughs> I can't do that. But um, in my opinion, which is redundant, and I hate when people say that, but in my opinion, you you should follow the trend. You must have a ability to control losses and have the ability for un limited gains and you have to believe in what you do and then obviously money management is crucial and then also you have the psychology to follow a plan all right how much of your overall market affects your decision about how loose you make your stops at a pullback ah uh, that's a good question uh, the the underlying stock itself usually is the is the main thing in fact it is the main thing so don't look at the underlying stock in and of itself and the volatility in and of itself when you go to set that stop now i hear what you're saying let's say we have the mother of all pullbacks in the market and the market's very overbought in a serious downtrend kind of like what we could be entering into now then Maybe there's a chance that you could be playing that stock just right because the market's getting ready to roll over, the stock's going to roll over, and everything else. So if you were a more nimble type of trader, then maybe you could play like an opening gap reversal or some sort of pattern where you could take a stab at it and use a really tight stop. I would, I would encourage you not to, not to always do that because before you know it, you're going to end up micromanaging yourself, tripping over the nickels, go to dollars, and you're going to be doing a lot of little – uh, the bad behaviors could could uh, kind of rear their ugly head if you did that too much. But I hear what you're saying. If if the market is is kind of pulled in one direction, if that rubber band is stretched in one direction, then yeah, it's likely to stop snap back, and maybe you could use a tight stop on that position. But just be careful in doing that because I think you could back into bad habits or back into old habits. Everyone look at it. So. I would encourage you just to follow the plan and give that stock an appropriate stop. And we've we've had we've done quite a few shows on setting stops, so go in and, and see this. One day I'm gonna get everything organized. Somebody actually offered to help me a while back, and I didn't take them up on that. So I need to I need to track them down and say, okay, maybe I'm ready for that because I think that we've got so much good information out there. Um, it just it's just kind of a mess in the, in the organization. Okay, so. Uh, for example, the pullback of the downtrend looks very similar to one that happened in August, September 2015, then it resumed a strong downtrend. Mini double bottom looks the same. Do you loosen the stop up because it has a history of repeating itself? No, you, you don't You don't want to loosen your stop up if you're already in existing position. You just have to kind of like lick your wounds if it happens. Take your lumps, lick your wounds, move on. Ancient hedge fun proverb, he who fights and runs away, loses a fight another day. I wonder if that's in my Russian proverbs book. <laughs> uh, I'm such a nerd, but that's okay. I, I, think, the, uh, I think the geeks will inherit the earth. Uh, where was I? Uh, no, take your lumps. Now, let's say that we get dangerously close to a stop today. And then tomorrow... We know, like I just said, that stop is probably be taken out on the open. It's okay to pull that stop on the open, again, with the main caveat, the big old caveat that you are disciplined. And then if the market rolls right back over, then you put the stop back in. So you could use your brain sometimes. Just don't try to beat the system through micromanagement. So micromanagement and discretion, they seem a lot alike, but they're vastly apart, okay? All right, Michael. Hey, welcome, Michael. Good to see you. Can you talk about how exactly you trail stops after your profit target? Specifically, if stock goes down $1 to new highs, how – goes up or down $1 new highs. How do you decide between raising a lowering stop by $0.20, cents, $0.50, cents, $0.80? Cents? Just gut feel, support and resistance. Thanks, pal. Keep up the great work. All right, Mike. Good to see you in here. I'm flattered that you would take time out of your schedule to be here. I know Mike. He's a good guy. Um Okay, well, there's a few things I do, and, and again, I don't want to turn this into redoing a webinar that I've done 
a hundred times, but it is a good question. What I do is a combination of things. One, yeah, it's feel. Um, and then obviously, once we hit the initial profit target, so initially we might trail a little tighter on something. And once we hit that initial profit target, we make sure we get that stop down to break even. Okay, so that's your swing trade loaf. In more recent times, I've been a little bit more lenient in trailing that, not so much on a one from one basis, just to get positions a little bit more room to work. What stops is always a trade off. The looser your stop or the more you're willing to let the stop open up or the bigger the stop you use going in, the better the chances are that you're going to capture a longer term trend. So the, the looser your trailing stop, the looser your original stop, the better the chances you capture a longer term trend. But obviously you're going to give up more of the profits in the end. So it's a bit of a trade off. But on the first loaf, as a general statement, it's one for one, okay? And again, in more recent times, it's, if it's a high price stock like MOH, $66 a share, and it goes a half a point in my favor, I probably won't bother ratcheting it down to half a point, you know? But maybe on another half a point, maybe I'll start trailing a little bit. But in the first loaf, as a general statement, it, it's it's one to one or close to one to one. And again, not to beat the dead horse, but I have become a little bit more lenient in that in more recent times. On the second loaf, as you say, it's a bit feel, but there's a few things that I do. First of all, I play keep the change, and I have a, a quite a few little games I like to play in trading. But one of them is keep the keep the change. These are fun. Uh, keep the change, not keep the gains. Games. Keep the change. And let's say stock moves 20 cents or 30 cents or 40 cents or even 50 cents. And it's a high price stock like this. And you've already taken your partial profits out. And I hate to use the terminology or the phrase, but it's but it's for lack of a better phrase, you're playing with the market's money. Then you can play the keep the change game. You could say, oh, OK, uh, it moved 20 20 cents or 30 cents in my favor, whatever. Just keep the change. I'm not going to bother adjusting my stop. 20 or 30 cents. So you've let that stop open up by 20 or 30 cents or whatever the case may be. The other thing that I do, and again, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but let's say you are fortunate enough and you get, uh, let's say the stock and you're short, let's say it drops three points. Well, what you might do is you might drop that stop. You might drop it two points, okay? So you're gaining, you're gaining ground, you're gaining two points of ground, but you're also letting things open up a little bit, okay? So you're willing to give up that one extra point. So on a nice, nice move, you don't take the full move. You say, oh, okay, well, I'm going to let it open up a little bit. Now, if you think about it, and I've done presentations on this too, if you trade properly, you're capturing two things. A price move, well, one, one, a price move, I should say. Two things are happening, I should say. The price moves in your favor, and number two, it accelerates in your favor, which in turn increases the volatility of the stock. So the stock that you originally started trading has now changed its personality a little bit. It has now become slightly more volatile or a lot more volatile, okay? So... The stock was just kind of sleepy little stock and you got it because you thought it looked pretty good. All of a sudden it starts making these big moves. So the volatility has changed. But you have the tiger by the tail, or as Covell says, you're riding that bouncing bronco. So you want to let things open up a little bit. So uh, keep the change, gaining ground, as long as you feel like you're gaining some ground. And then again, in the end, it's 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 you're going to give up some of those open profits. But sometimes you get lucky, obviously. And it comes up and it rolls back over after getting close. So uh, I've got a few YouTubes. Again, they're not organized well, Michael, but uh, one day we'll get around to doing that. And uh, I'll help you out. If you have a stop, you're out. Uh, is that a question or a statement? Okay. Nothing to do. Yeah, 
as a general statement, if you have a stop, you're out. Absolutely. There's nothing to do. But if you are disciplined in your trading, and again, I won't I won't spend too much time in this and beat the dead horse. But let's say you're disciplined in your trading, and at the end of today, MOH closes somewhere near that that stop. So at the end of today, let's say MOH is right here. Oops. Talk amongst yourselves. Oops. Well, it won't let me do it. At the end of the day, let's say MOH closes here, where you know it's a good chance it's going to open up above that stop tomorrow. If you're not disciplined, yeah, let the stop take you out. Forget about it, okay? But if you are disciplined, let it open up, and if it rolls right back over, then put in your stop right above where that stop was, or even back where the stop was, and it comes back in. Are there different psychological challenges on the short side than the long side? Yeah, shorts, shorts will piss you off. Shorts, pardon my French, but dang, that sounds like English. Shorts are, shorts are a pain in the ass because shorts have big retrace rallies. So it's hard. It, it is a Wall Street adage. All shorts will go against you. Now, I was somewhere and someone says, oh, I get out of the first signs of adversity. Well, you would never make a dime on the short side if you did that. Because if you look at this trade here, where do we, I mean, this is just happens to be up here. Let's see, where do we get at 66? So yeah, where to get 66? Hey, we're looking good. Oh, we're losing money. Hey, we're looking good. Oh, we're breaking even. You know, it's like, it seems like they always, we might've gotten in like right here or something. I forget exactly where, but it was against us, for us, against us, for us, against us. It's going to be a bumpy ride on the short side. It's one of the few things I can guarantee. Uh, sometimes money comes really fast. I mean, what's the old adage? They slide faster than they glide. Um, and then that could go to your head, too. It creates some problems. On the long side, if it just kind of grinds its way higher day after day after day after day, you could just kind of sit back and say, oh, this is kind of fun. I'm just going to drink a cup of coffee and and watch this market go higher, this stock go higher every day, and that's that's pretty damn easy. Well, I like this Dave Landry fellow. He's uh he's pretty sharp with this trend following. This trend following is fun. On the short side, a little tougher. And again, I keep referring to all these videos that are out there, but I, I did quite a few presentations where, in an ideal world, the short side would look like this, and the reality, like you shorted, but the reality is it looks more like this, you know. Uh, and then, of course, it implodes after knocking you out. So it's tough. The short side is a lot, of a lot tougher. Make no bones about it. Um, if you are, there's nothing wrong with just staying, being long only oriented and sitting on your hands doing a market slide. The good news is market slides, bear markets, I should say, are a lot shorter than bull markets. So there's nothing wrong with sitting on your hands, let it all unfold. And then get back in when the market starts going back up again. Also, a lot of people like, Dave, I'm not going to re-up the service because I don't short. And I don't see you putting on any longs in, any, in the foreseeable future. Well, next day I put on two longs, okay? Because you never know when that next opportunity is going to come along. But it's okay to sit on your hands on the short side. But the beauty of the short side is, as I've often preached, and again, yet another webinar that I've done multiple times, the beauty of the short side is that it helps you to see both sides of the market. And my friends who are long oriented, and some of them are very smart, and some of them are running billions, not billions, but uh, hundreds of billions of dollars specifically, uh, a few of them I'm thinking of. And they always tend to be a little bit more half glass half full versus glass half empty. If you Google that on my website, Google half full, I think I've got an article or two or I should say a blog. I hate that word blog, but for lack of a better word, a couple of blog posts on that. And also have some videos. But the short side, playing the short side, I should say, helps you to see both sides of the market. And that's the importance of it, okay? If you wait to see what happens and it goes another 1, 2, 3, 4, 5% win, 3, 4, 5, okay, if it goes another... 
Well, there's nothing exactly, uh, but if it's a, it, let's say the market, we come in tomorrow and God forbid it gaps open, okay, we well, already have that loss on the books. So what you do there is you, you're willing to give it a few extra points because you're already, you're already beaten up. You're, you're dead already. A few extra points ain't going to kill you, so to speak, okay? But yeah, you don't want to you don't want to go willy nilly and throw caution to the wind. If the stock closes right here today and then tomorrow it opens here and starts rallying up, you have to have some sort of uncle point in mind. If it doesn't reverse within so so many minutes and it goes so many points against you, then you say, you know what, I'm out. And in a case like this where you already got that first profit on it. Ideally, you want to make sure you stop out at a profit, especially from a psychological standpoint, on that second loaf. You don't want to let all of that profit evaporate, okay? In this case, it wouldn't be that much if you did give it some wiggle room. Yeah, Craig, I, you know, I thought about that, too, in the back of my head, unless you're getting a margin call. Yeah, uh, I agree. It ain't going to kill you, but that's provided, of course, you're not – you didn't get a margin call. You didn't go, uh, you didn't go debit or something stupid, uh, but, yeah, I hear you on that. Um, and, but the good thing about a margin call is you, you're, if you're a deer in the headlights, the broker is going to take care of the position for you. Hey, I, I'm just going to get you out, buddy. Don't worry about that. Cause he don't, he doesn't want to be left holding the bag. And we all know what's in that bag. Short is hard because most of it happens in a few days, smaller time frames. Uh, yeah, it does. But sometimes it unfolds kind of slowly, kind of like a Chinese water torture. And, uh, those charts could be wonderful charts to get into. Uh, you don't know it going going into them, thinking to, to become a Chinese water torture. But sometimes once you're in them, they can just slowly grind lower, and they can be great trades. I think OZRK was a good example of that. And the good news is, uh, sometimes when you have that happen, you end up with a waterfall. And MOH is not really the best example, but you can see it didn't implode all at once. It took its time, and then finally we hit that initial profit target, and then what it do? It just kind of meandered. It finally started head lower, and then, of course, now we're in the retrace. Okay, Craig says, it is the volatility that ch challenges the psychology. Up markets tend to grind higher. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, the up markets can – Sometimes just kind of grind higher and grind higher and grind higher, okay? And that's a lot easier, as I just said a few minutes ago. It's a lot easier to sit back and let that unfold and, like, watch a movie. But it's a lot tougher on the short side when it all kind of happens over a brief period of time. Okay, um, any more questions while we're on the slides? And I'll go ahead and get the charts fired up. While waiting to see what if it passed, goes through the stop, it keeps going, when do you pull the trigger? then uh you have to have that uncle point in mind ahead of time and like i said you don't want to let that 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 winning trade turn into a loser altogether once you've um hit that uh, initial profit target okay let's go ahead and get the um the charts up and running oh by the way this is a new site um so check it out when you get a chance and the the blog posts are down towards the bottom and I'm going to start doing more and more of these video updates in here. I'm still working through a few kinks on some things, but uh, it looks like it's um, it's working out pretty nicely. Okay. All right, let me pull up the charts. Okay, let's take a look at the um, the macro, or the micro, I should say. Then work into the macro. Uh, if you guys want to start asking stocks about questions about individual stocks, feel free to start now. Uh, just put one stock, one ticker on the line, and then uh, hit return. By the way, somebody asked me, how do I know a market's oversold? Because sometimes I'll say, hey, market's oversold. Well, like most everything I do when it comes to market, it's just common sense. I'm not using a, a Bollinger Band or whatever, standard deviation band, whatever you want to call it, or something like that to tell me that a market's oversold. Um, 
although I did see some post on on um, on Facebook by Bollinger about uh, somebody was posted about how wide the Bollinger bands have become, which was kind of interesting. Uh, but I'm not using some sort of indicator. Nothing wrong with those indicators. Uh, you know, I know John. I respect John and people like John that use those type of things. But for me, I just like to eyeball things. And net net is is probably the most important thing. So over an intermediate term time frame, several weeks meaning intermediate term, if I take this peak here and I measure down to let's say right there, and then I take a look at what that that move is, okay, that's a 13% move down in a market over just a few months. For something like the S&P 500, that's a pretty big deal. Um, if the S&P 500 goes up 13% in a year, most everybody's happy. That's a pretty good for the buy and hope crowd. That's just pretty much indexing. A lot of, by the way, a lot of fund managers. That, that's all they do. You know, we pick stocks. No, they don't. No, they don't, Danny. A lot of the fund managers I have learned. I don't want to call out anybody in particular. But they can get in a lot of trouble picking picking stocks. So what they do is they play it safe. They pick they pick the stocks that will mimic the S and P 500 the best. Okay. And as far as their quote unquote picking actual stocks that could beat the market, they'll go out and they'll pick a few and make it look like they're picking stocks. But they'll keep that core portfolio in enough stocks that will mimic the index so they don't lose their job, okay? So for the most part, even sometimes when you're in a fund, <laughs> you're really just indexing along, okay? And take the look at the fund and look at the S&P 500 and see if they look pretty much the same, okay? So the point is 13% in a year is actually a pretty good gain, on an index like the S&P 500. And it did that in just a few weeks. So we know that it's oversold. We know it's due to bounce. Um, if you really want to look at things much shorter term, you can look at the last little slide in here. And that's 6% round numbers in how many days? Six days, maybe? One, two, three, four, five, six, well, eight days. Okay, still percent a day, almost a percent a day is a pretty significant move for a market for to do that eight days in a row, I guess three quarters of a percent for eight days in a row. So just use common sense, just kind of eyeball it. Um, I, I'm sure you could use, a, you know, maybe a Bollinger Band would help tell you if it's overbought or oversold, maybe looking uh, at a moving average or something and how far away it's stretched from the moving average. I know a lot of people do a lot of things like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just prefer to kind of eyeball it. But yeah, put a moving average in. Let's just, let's throw a 50 in there, okay? And let's see if we're stretched away from the 50 or whatever. So uh, a couple days ago, we were, let's see, you know, right here, we were stretched fairly far away from the 50. Well, what happens? Well, we come back up towards that 50, okay? So now we're not so stretched too far, far away from it. So it's a little bit more closer to that. So the problem is when you start using these indicators is just use – Make sure you you fully study them and fully understand them. To me, it just all comes back to common sense. But if you're using these indicators, well, do you use a 50-day moving average? Do you use a 200-day moving average? Because it, the market's going to look a lot different depending on what moving average you use. Or do you use a 10-day moving average? So uh, it's like the ATR things. Are you stop set based on ATRs? Well, I guess if you boil it down, yeah, they could be. But what ATR are you using? How many days? What's your look back? How many times the ATR? Two and a half ATR? Is that enough? Three times? You know, so make sure you fully understand what you're doing if you want to, to do a little bit more quantifying. And, and I've spent, um, I guess, divide my career into another slice. I guess the first uh, big part of my career, I did spend a lot of time trying to quantify everything. But I've since learned to use common sense. Now, the S&P uh, did a little fake out. One thing I did want to point out, too, is a Linda Rasky quote, and I asked her where she got it, and she said, I don't know, we'll probably heard it from somebody on the floor. Uh, so it's just what she calls a floorism. And we had the bow tie, weekly bow tie in the S&P, 
And Linda's quote was, the market will often do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner, meaning that if it looks like it's going to sell off out of a pullback, what's it going to do first? It's going to have a big retrace rally and then sell off, okay? And then the corollary to that is the market will do what it has to do to cause the most pain to the most people. So when it looks like it's obviously going to do something, it might still do that, but in an unobvious manner that will cause pain to the participants. So how does that shake out in the charts? Well, we had this weekly bow tie here, and it was a beautiful setup, almost textbook in nature. In fact, you'll see it. If I ever write another book, you'll see it in a book, I'm sure. And what did the market do? Just triggered enough to get everybody thinking, ah, that big day is pretty smart. And then what happens? It shoots right back up towards the old highs. Now, anybody who held on to stocks through the slide, what do they do? Oh, we're almost back to old highs. Everything is good. I knew I should not have. I, I sound like Donald Trump. I'm not sure. I sound like Jimmy Fallon imitating Donald Trump. <laughs> You know, I'm not sure why I, I I would ever get out of the market because this is great. And then what happens when, when the market begins to tank? Now they're forced to reevaluate their their decision. So at at even me, you know, it's like, well, looks like this bow tie might not be working, but I'm not going to call it quits or I'm not going to give up or completely ignore the signal until the market goes on to make new highs. And at that point, I'm going to say, okay, well. That was wrong. I was wrong. The market did not, uh, they didn't work this time. There's no guarantees. Okay. You want guarantee? Buy a toaster. Yet another classic Big Dave column. But we did have the bow tie. It ran up, but it stalled short of the old highs. Just that I've got just close enough to make everybody think, oh, I dodged another bullet. This eternal sunshine of this market only going up since 2009. Oh, man, this is great. I'm going to just keep on keeping on. I'm not letting go. <laughs> a friend of my wife's called me a couple days ago. <laughs> Dave, I started investing last year. What do I do? Yeah, Is there a website I could go to to learn something? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> DaveLandry.com. DaveRamsey.com? No, DaveLandry.com. I think Dave Ramsey tells you to buy and hope. But that's fodder for another conversation. So anyway, most unobvious thing in the most most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner, and also what will it have to do to cause the most pain to the most people? So when you're reading the charts, you could say, okay, well, this market had a little throwback towards these old highs. So whoever was still long was thinking, okay, I'm okay. Unfortunately, when it begins to sell off again, it puts more pressure on these people. Ramsey. <laughs> Well, I don't know who I, I, I don't know who it was. It, it, he may have he may have gotten in trouble with the SEC for saying it, but there was somebody out there, and I used to hate I used to hate people who would listen to these people, and they'd come tell me how smart they are because they listen to these people. But there was somebody on the radio that was saying, and they were promoting mutual funds and getting paid to promote mutual funds. Okay, and they were saying that. You would make 12%. Just stay with the fund. Every year, every year, you're going to make 12%. Well, that that doesn't always happen like it's guaranteed. And I think you got in trouble with the SEC. I don't know who it is, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus because we all get our butt handed to us at some point in this business. But you shouldn't make claims that aren't true that could get people – that you shouldn't make claims that could hurt people, okay? Do no harm first is what I say. Okay, Craig has confirmed who it is. Yep. Did he? Did the SEC go after him on that? Um, I'd be curious to know, and I'm not going to – again, we're not going to name names because he could probably uh, sick his lawyers on me. Okay, um, let's finish up the markets, and then I'll jump – I promise I'll get to those stocks. We have plenty of time this week. Uh, overall market, let's get back to the P's. Uh, on a micro basis, we rallied up in here. Uh, so we've kind of eradicated that oversold condition to some extent. Longer term, yeah, we're still kind of oversold. We could bounce even more. Uh, everybody that brother's looking for 1950 because that's also the 50-day moving average. What might happen is uh, 
we'll stall short of that and then it rolls back over like we might be doing now. Okay, again, it would be the most, uh, what, would, what would happen to cause the most pain to most people. The people are waiting for that 50-day moving average to get hit. That'll never happen. Of course, the other thing would be it shoots past it. Everybody's like, oh, we broke through it, and then, then it comes back in. So keep in mind that, that markets are tricky, obviously, especially indices. Indices are, are tough. But if you just keep the bigger picture in mind and say, okay, what's going on? with the S&P 500. What is the average Joe thinking? Okay. Well, the average Joe who started investing in 1999, I'm sorry, 2009. That's, that's two different conversations. So let's go to a, uh, let's go to a five day chart, a weekly chart. So the average Joe who started investing way back here, he's pretty happy, but he's beginning to see that investment begin to, drop the average joe who started investing in late 2013 is now beginning to see a negative return on his investment so now he's faced with a two-year loss okay and like the person i mentioned earlier she just got started last year and she's already skeptical about these markets well markets train people both good and bad. And she should be skeptical, and that's good. She's reading the layman's guide to trading stocks, and I'm flattered that she is. And she's like, holy moly, I thought I understood markets. I don't understand markets. I thank you, Dave, for the book. You're welcome. Okay? But she got a wake-up call really quick. The problem is the people that have been drinking the Kool-Aid since 2009, okay, they're beginning to see some of their profits evaporate, but they're also thinking, oh, I'm just going to hold on. I'm still up 150%, 140%, 130%, 100%, 90%, 80%. You know, <laughs> at some point, either because psychologically they get worn down or because their kid goes to college or if they do something stupid or their wife does something stupid, I guess it's a two-way street, you know, uh, and they have to divide everything up 50-50, then maybe they're going to be forced out. And the combination of that having to sell and the market dropping could be a double whammy. So never forget there are people behind the bars and people that say stupid things that you could just buy certain mutual funds and they'll always go up should be behind bars. But I don't want to digress too far. All right, Steve Kosaba is my resident musician today. Steve, how you doing, buddy? I got your CD right here on my desk. Steve's a friend of the show and a sponsor. Okay, ALK. -okay. Um, I think the stock's in trouble. It does have quite a bit of support right here. By accident, we had that weekly chart up. That weekly sure does look beautiful, though. Let's take a look at that weekly. Weekly looks pretty darn good on this one. Uh, it's on the cusp of a bow tie weekly. I think the stock's in a lot of trouble. My only problem with it on a daily basis is that you do have a lot of support just below the market, thereabouts, okay? And it didn't really undercut this prior low by that much. So ideally, you want to see a thrust, pullback, thrust, as opposed to thrusts, pullback, kind of a, a mini thrust like this and then, then a pullback like that, okay? Uh, but Dave, that sounds like a witch hat. No, a witch hat is going to look a little bit uh, differently. Let me show you what a witch hat will look like if I can get a, um, if I can get a screen up here. A witch hat is when you have a a thrust and kind of like a retrace up, like looks like this, okay? Kind of looks like a witch's hat. I like them on the short side more than the long side. So imagine an upside down witch's hat is what it looks, what I called it for lack of a better name. So witch's hat is not, is not this, where this leg here is not that big. This leg here needs to be significant, like I have it over here and not like this. So if you have the stock selection course, notice that like on an upside pullback example, I had an example like that. So this, let me redraw that. 
So this pullback here is probably something you wouldn't want to trade because you barely kind of cleared that prior high before you pull back and then you pull back to the prior area of the of the prior pattern. So it, in fact, if you don't have the, the seminar, the webinar seminar, whatever it was, that you could at least go to my website, click on the on the landing page for it, or go to the store, click on it, and there's a one hour video, and I'm 99% sure that I went into detail on why you don't want to want that pattern. But Steve, that's what's happening um, with that uh, particular thing. So we really didn't get too far past this prior one. Plus, there's a lot of support, so I'm going to pass on that one based on that. Uh, let me interview myself. Is it in trouble? Yes. Uh, but I don't think you should take the trade. James wants to know about APC. APC. Oops. Um, long or short, James. Uh, this is a stock that's in a longer term downtrend, obviously. And it did sort of rally off its lows, but it still looks like it's a, a pretty serious downtrend. It looks okay on the long side, um, but it looks like the it really hasn't turned a corner just yet. And the fact that it's kind of rolling back over, I, I think I would sit on my hands on this one and see what happens. So that's that's a, that's a really stretch on a pioneer setup now it's it's a little tough so these setups are kind of tough but this isn't really that huge of a move given the nature of the downtrend so i would maybe wait for the bow tie now it's a good problem to have but you also have a significant amount of overhead supply to deal with on that one so i would sit tight on the energies for a little while i think we could possibly see something there soon dathan says simple d y short set up on pullback yeah we're short that already we're already short a good eye. <laughs> we could take a look at the live portfolio if you want. So yeah, look, DY right there. Short set up a pullback, but it still has outran the weekly downward bow tie a bit, maybe a bit early to set entry. Well, this, this, okay. I'm asked about overbought and oversold. Well, you have to take it within context of the move. This is a pretty serious move lower in this stock. Okay, let's measure that and see what we got thereabouts. Let's measure it right there. That's a 45% drop over a fairly short period of time. And, and uh, at least I don't know what the volatility was back here, but it's not a super, super volatile stock. I guess in more recent times it has become one. So for me to trade a stock like this as a new setup, it would have to pull back a little bit more than where it is now, maybe to 60 or above, because longer term, it's pretty oversold because it dropped round numbers 50% over a couple of months. So that's pretty oversold longer term. So for me to short a stock like this, it would have to pull back a little bit more as a new position in and of itself. But full disclosure, we are short this stock, okay? Now, I wouldn't necessarily, you gotta be careful with the weeklies on the short side because it unfolds much faster, as you know, on the short side. If you sit around waiting for a weekly signal, then you might be sitting around for a long time and watching stocks just go by, okay? Watch them go zoom it by you. But Dave, you talk about the weekly bow tie all the time. Yeah, but it wasn't like I sat around and waited for a weekly bow tie before I started getting concerned about the market. It just so happened that a weekly bow tie later ensued. Okay, and you can look at some of the shorts that were short. I'm sure they're on the verge or the cusp of making weekly bow ties, making major, major tops in here. But I didn't sit around and wait for that weekly bow tie. So it's okay to look at the weekly chart. Just be careful with it. What I used to do is I used to – plot a weekly on one screen and a daily on the other. And I would look at the daily and then get an eye of the weekly. But what I started doing on my other screen, instead of when doing my analysis, I just backed the chart way out and I look at a daily chart to give me a feel for what's going on. So if I see, if we, let's say we're on this day here and I'm seeing some sort of setup, I'm like, oh, that looks pretty good. 
and this is what my screen looks like. I'm seeing this kind of set up here, bow tie or whatever. Then I take a look to my right and back the chart way out and say, oh yeah, that does look like it's in trouble. It does look like it's coming off of high levels. Okay. So I no longer put the weekly on one chart. I just use a long, long term daily. Susie says, uh, I hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, can we have a look at uh, SWN, please? That's going to be an ETF, I think. No, no, no. I was wrong. That's Southwest Energies, uh, an oil fuel stock. This looks like a stock that's bottoming out, okay? I think it's too early to buy it, though. But it's it's a beautiful, nice little persistent trend. And by the way, like I said earlier, you usually don't get such a persistent move to the downside. And when you do... You, you eventually get this waterfall type of situation where it just finally implodes. I think this stock is bottoming out. I think it's worth putting on your radar, but I think it's also too early. So for me to get excited, it would probably have to take out at least eight. And what's at eight? Lo and behold, the 50 day moving average. And then we'll keep an eye on it for maybe a bow tie or a first thrust or even a cup and handle type pattern or something like that. But too, way too early on that one. But it's OK. Just just sit back and relax. Uh, let it unfold. Terry wants to talk about GLD, the commodity. Oops. Wait, did I mess up? My charts messed up. Oh, sorry about that. Let's go back to SWN. <laughs> oh, but I didn't make an idiot myself. Yeah, what did I say? I'd have to get above eight and make a bow tie or something. So uh, what did it do? Hey, it got above eight. It made a bow tie. How do you like that? Um yeah, so your entry would have probably been in here somewhere. If you're long, stay long. If you're not, I would not buy it at this juncture. Maybe wait for a, a thrust above this range and get in. Wow, that's uh, that kind of worked out cool. Uh, but, yeah, if you're long, stay long. Have maybe a stop down here somewhere close to these lows just in case it comes back in. Maybe give it a plenty of room. I mean, it's got an HV of 117, which is pretty extreme. So I would give this stock at least two points. So percentage-wise, it sounds like a lot, but it's well within the volatility of the stock or just outside of it. Uh, yeah, so your bow tie would have triggered here. You'd be long if you took that bow tie trade, but I would just sit tight. Uh, sit tight if you're long. Have a stop maybe down around six or seven. Well, maybe even below below seven, maybe down six and change, and then sit tight. Uh, if you're not long, then wait. Let it break out again, and then look to play the first pullback. Okay. Hey, sorry about that. That's kind of a... That's crazy. Let's take a look at gold for Terry for forget. I thought gold looked funny. Uh, gold just kind of, so no pun intended, just sort of melted up in here. We did have the bow tie buy back here. It would have triggered right around here. The reason I didn't like it back then, and again, sometimes I look for perfection, sometimes to a fault. But my problem was gold, with gold is that it had so much overhead supply to overcome. And then if it got past that supply, then it had more supply than more supply. You could go back in time quite a bit. Uh, it didn't really care what I thought. It just went straight through it all. And that's fine. I don't care. Uh, I, I, I made my decision. I stuck with it. And we, we're obviously in a little bit of correction mode here. But based on the magnitude of this run, and again, it's all common sense, but let's just look at this last little run. That's a 15% move for gold to commodity. That's significant. Look at your volatility, HV of 19. So 15% over a short period of time. That's kind of equivalent to like the indices moving 13 or 14% or over a short period of time. So uh, I would be concerned about that as far as buying. And I would let it pull back a little bit more uh, before doing that. And then, of course, you will have some problems along the way with this overhead, overhead supply. Rather than buy the underlying commodity, I would rather focus on um, the uh, individual stocks. Before I forget, I, I didn't go through the NASDAQ. Did I go through the NASDAQ and everything? NASDAQ, uh, like the P's, looks like it's in trouble. Open a gap reversal today. It looks poised to continue. It's downtrend. Let's take a look at the Rusty before I forget. Uh, Rusty, like everything else, is down towards multi-year lows. The Rusty, by media measurements, already is in a bear market. It's down 20-something percent. The media calls the bear market 20, 20%. So always keep an eye on that, Rusty. Most sectors look like they're in a lot of trouble. The metals and mining on a daily basis are beginning to bottom out and bow tie and all. I think we can find some opportunities here, and that's why we're going after a couple of those in the open portfolio. 
And then again, not to beat the dead horse, but as I would say, quite a bit, the Amazons, the Netflix, the Starbucks, the big cap stocks in there that are kind of propping up the market, the same stocks that those quote unquote stock pickers throw into their portfolio to make their portfolio as good as the S&P, but it's a stock picker portfolio. Those same stocks, as they begin to crack, it's going to take the whole, down, whole market down with it. Okay, I'm just kind of backing into that, but if you think about it, it's not only holding up the index, but it's also holding up everybody's portfolio who's buying those stocks to make it look like the index, even though they want to hold themselves out as being stock pickers. And again, you know, I guess I'm in a glass house here, and I better, I better knock it off. I'm, I'm picking on, I'm picking on way too many people. They're gonna come knock on my door. Phil wants to talk about AEM. There you go. That's an individual gold stock. Let's talk about that. And then most sectors are in downtrends uh, right now. My problem with the gold stocks is they're kind of wide and loose. And somebody was recently asked me, are you a little bit more lenient in setups? And the answer is yes, but they're just so wide and loose. Uh, I think this one looks okay. Uh, it does have a lot of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say bad memories, but a lot of wide and loose trading kind of deal with, but it looks okay. Um, I, I'd like a tiny bit more of a pullback in it before uh, going after it, but the gold's been kind of quirky. I think there's no, um, there's no really easy way to trade gold right now. You, you might just have to close your eyes in some cases if you want to be long gold. I uh, just got asked about Amazon. Ironically, I just missed it. Yeah, Amazon's in trouble. I think Amazon's a possible short in here. Um, and the, it doesn't have a lot of support until right here. That might be a little, that might, that would sort of make me think twice about the trade. But hey, if you got from there to there, I think that'd be okay. Um, if you're an institution, yeah, that'd be a good, uh, that, excuse me, that would be a good short. Uh, Andre wants to know about AUMN. I'll be seeing you likely in a couple days there, Andre. Um, a little bit on the thin side. This is a very speculative, low-priced, thin gold stock. I hear you, though. It's uh, bow tied up. It's kind of melting up in here, no pun intended. I would wait for a correction. Technical analysis, when you're dealing with a really thin penny stock, you got to be careful with that because it's only trading 100 shares, 100,000 shares on average. So that's $50,000 worth of trading a day. We're looking at Amazon, which trades what, 500 million, a billion, 2 billion, 10 billion dollars a day. So it's a really thin stock. So I wouldn't, I, I want to stop. I don't want to get into too much technical analysis on it, but I hear what you're saying. It, it, it's broken out. It's bow tied. Maybe wait for a pullback, but I would just caution you to just maybe just avoid that one altogether. Phil is a gold bug today. He wants to talk about AUY. All right, Phil. That's going to be your mama gold. AUY. Am I right? Yep, your mama. Your man, I guess. I call it your mama. Um, Yeah. Again, you know, these golds, you got all this dang overhead supply to deal with. But it tried to bow tie, came back in, and then noticed that it made a slightly lower low. This faked out anybody. Anybody was holding it here thinking, oh, I'm just going to hold on forever. It's like, oh, no, I'm not. I'm just going to get out. I give up. And then, of course, it bottoms out. Um, I think it looks great. I would pass based on the overhead supply. If you're long, stay long. You're welcome, Steve. Ask you. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you about this stock. All right. Andre has the gold bug and he likes penny stocks. Uh, again, same sort of thing as the other one. Uh, 200,000 on average volume. It's not even a uh, dollar a share. So, yeah, it's turned a corner. Wait for a pullback. But I would caution anyone in here against actually going after that. It's probably gambling at best. I mean, if you got a thousand bucks to piss away, buy a thousand shares. Seven hundred bucks to piss away, buy seven hundred shares. And forget about it. But you know, the problem with doing that is, if you knew the company would never go out of business. But uh, this stock's in a lot of trouble, longer term. But uh, shorter term, looks like it's trying to turn the corner. AYI pullback, but there is a recent low that may be resistance. What are your thoughts? All right, let's take a look at that. AYI, good bunch today, by the way. A lot of friendlies in here. That's nice. Uh, yeah, it looks good. I, it's a little bit, the volume is a little light on the short side. I usually like to see a little bit more than 500,000, but it's okay. Uh, I agree. This is sort of a witch hat. 
in here. Um, you have a problem with that? I don't. I don't know. Uh, I think it was, I think it looks okay. Um, I can't pull up my list today, but that that one does sound familiar. But yeah, I think it looks okay. I think it's a good looking setup. Um, kind of a witch hat type of pattern. I'll give you a high five on that one. Yeah, high five. Don wants to look at big. Big could be a short, but it's kind of all over the place. That's going to be big lots. Um, it sold off. It, it's it's a possible. It's in a possible downtrend here. It's kind of wide and loose, as you can see, longer term. Let's zoom in a little bit. And then shorter term, it just hasn't gone anywhere since what? Uh, December. December would be January, February. So now you would, uh, wait, uh, January, February. Yeah, two months and change of sideways movement. So I would leave that one alone. Okay, we're looking at 30 year ZB. Is that a 30 year bond? Treasure bond? Yeah, it's interesting that uh, Fed said we're going to raise rates. So what are bonds doing? They're going the opposite way. Bonds look okay. I, I wouldn't rush out and buy bonds. You're not going to get rich buying bonds. Um, but yeah, I see. I hear you. Uh, you got a nice little thrust higher, a little bit of a pullback. They look okay. You could certainly do much worse. I think if you're going to do something in this market, yeah, run out and buy bonds. That's that's fine. I don't know what you mean by ZB. Is that bonds, uh, Soul? We'll come back to that. Uh, Andre wants to know about DRD. That's going to be a gold stock. Uh, a little bit on the thin side. Again, um, I can tell where Andre is today. He likes these little thin gold stocks and cheap ones. Uh, let it pull back a little bit more. It's it's had such an incredible run. It's up, what, two, three hundred percent over a short period of time. Yeah, I don't have that on my on my uh, chart, ZB. I'm using um, Telechart. TLT is the bond. Okay, Susie says, uh, I bought the bounce in ABX today at 11.90. What do you think about? Okay. Well, as long as you have a plan in place, then um, stick to your plan. You do have a lot of overhead supply, but it looks like it's trying to get through it. Um, you know, on these golds, I might have to wait for second tier setups, meaning that let them bottom out, and then when they start just doing longer term pullbacks, get on get on board. Uh, XRA, that's going to be an ETF, I think. Nope, it's a gold stock. Um, again, thin, thin, thin. We see a pattern, a pattern here, or as my daughter used to say when she was younger, a pattern. Uh, too much overhead, too, too thin. So let's let's not talk about that one too much. Yeah, it looks like it's bottomed out. If you were guaranteed, it would never um, go broke. If they'd ever go bankrupt, then yeah. Uh, Smith & Wesson uh, for Don. It looks okay as far as defying gravity in here. But for me, with my methodology to trade it now, we had it as a buy a while back, but it didn't trigger, as you know, or you may know. It would actually have to go to new highs and then pull back for me to get in. Uh, love the guns, hate the stock. Well, I don't really hate the stock. I mean, if you're playing a relative strength game, it's the best thing out there. Rick is going to be another gold. A lot of gold bugs in here today. Yeah, Rick's a little bit more interesting uh, as far as volume is concerned. This is Andre again asking. Uh, nice, nice breakout from a nice, nice base. Okay, so that's a good pattern. But you're going to need a pullback. So, yeah, on a pullback, fantastic. That's the best one you've uh, showed me so far. Argen for John, R G E N. Uh, if anything, a possible short. It's a little bit on the thin side. It's too wide and loose. Um, but I hear you. Possible short, yes, but too wide and loose. I'd avoid that one. Okay. NEM for Phil. Lots of gold bugs. Bugs. That's gonna be Newmont Mining. Yeah, this one looks pretty good, Phil. Um. Ideally, I'd like a little bit more pullback than that, but I hear you. I, I mean, ideally, and, I, and maybe I'm looking for too much perfection, but that looks that looks pretty damn good. Uh, pardon my French. Oh, David, it sounds like English. And I like that this trading here is sort of um, this overhead supply is behind all this trading. So, yeah, I, I would personally put this one on my radar, and I've been looking at these goals waiting for a pullback. Ideally, though, I like to see it pull back to maybe 22 or so, but uh, my hand may be forced at some of these goals. It might not ever happen. Please look at PLCE. You got it. PLCE. Um, well, it's defying gravity, but 
I wouldn't get excited about this stock until it took a took out its old high. Somebody was asking me earlier how to factor the market in. Well, the market's headed lower. It's got to be some really good looking stock. Municipal bonds and funds seem to gain strength. Yeah, well, as I often preach, you want to look at your new highs list every day to see what's going on. And in doing that, I'm seeing a lot of bond funds and muni bond funds and things like that. So that tells me that there's a flight to safety going on. ED for RJ, thanks for waiting patiently. ED, something I hope I never have someday. Uh, I'm sorry, that was an inside thought. I'd like it better if it wasn't if it wasn't just barely getting past this peak. If this was all out in clear air, I hear you though. Uh, you know this lake here and then down. It looks okay. Volatility a little bit low, but it's a utility. I say it's okay, but I would pass because it's just getting past this prior peak in here. I like to see something like that out in uh, clear air. David, you look at energies of the gold. They are all. And long-term downtrend look like they're bottoming now. So overhead supply is everywhere, which is strategy of this type of patterns. Do you recommend to not trade a type of pattern? Well, it, I'll know it when I see it. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. In the case of the energies, there is overhead supply, but but certain issues, there's not as much. Uh, and in a gold, same thing. But now gold has rallied enough to maybe start clearing some of that supply. So, yeah, case-by-case -case basis. I hear what you're saying, though. I agree with you. But uh, – Setup by setup, okay? Just like whatever the one we were looking at, uh, NEM and one of those earlier, that looked uh, okay, but it needed a little bit more pullback. Everyone seems to be looking to go long. I see a major top in the market. Am I wrong in the market? No, I think you're right. I, who's who's looking to go long? I think uh, I think the market is – if everyone's looking to go, go long, I think they're wrong because I think the market is sucking in people. I mean, if you didn't know anything about markets, just draw your line below the lows, 1,800, and draw your line across the top, 2,100. Now it sounds like Bill Clinton. Draw a line across the top. <laughs> and to me, you know, just measure your net net change. Let's go back a couple of years. And, well, had done a whole lot in a couple of years. So. I don't know why. I sound like Bill Clinton. But you can see we're kind of sideways at best. So I don't know. It doesn't look good. I mean, I do know. It doesn't look good. So I agree with you on that. Mux. Let's take a look at Mux. Yeah, that looks okay. But again, you've got a mountain of overhead supply to deal with. That one does have a little bit more volume, though. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, but too much overhead supply. So you can see we're eliminating a lot of these stocks based on that. MS Investment Bank Rally set up for short. MS. Um, yeah, the only problem with something like MS is it's in a longer-term downtrend already. It's way down here. It's already lost half its value. I'm still trying to find stocks that are at a little bit higher levels. I mean, if you take a look at, like, let's just throw up the spiders because it would be easy. Uh, even the S&P 500 is still at fairly high levels, okay? So at this stage of this, and I hate to say it, but bear market, I'm still looking at uh, – <laughs> somebody got my ED jokes. Uh, I'm still looking at stocks at higher levels, but eventually, yes, we will be forced to look at uh, stocks that are in those second legs. Okay, getting several questions for HMY from Steve, from Andre. Uh, HMY looks good. Um this is one of those ones that, that did not have a whole lot of supply, did make a nice bow tie back here, did take off. But I think you need to wait for a deeper pullback because it's already uh, double or tripled in value. So it's gotten a little far ahead of itself. James and James both want to know about GGB. I think it's the same, James. Uh, first thing I see with GGB is I see a mountain of overhead supply right here. So I would avoid it based on that. Uh, but if you zoom in a little bit, yeah, it's still there. But, uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. It kind of bottomed out, pulled back. Looks like it's ready to go. But right into a mountain of overhead supply. So, and, again, I hear you guys. I know it's tough. Um, GFI, this could be another gold. Used to be uh, Gramfield Health, but now it's a gold stock. Um, that looks pretty good. Uh, it does have a gap down. I'm not too concerned about gaps when it comes to commodity-related stocks. So, yeah, I'm going to give that one an okay or, or certainly not bad. 
Uh, it does have some resistors to deal with, but most of that would be cleared uh, if it began to trigger. So, and then so a lot of that's behind this peak here. So this is not as important as long as it's behind a peak, but it's still important nonetheless. Lulu. Lulu, 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 Lulu. No, it's just all over the place. It's amount of overhead supply. Don and I are often diametrically opposed when it comes to stocks. I try to teach him how to just pick stocks and uptrends, but he likes stocks that go all over the place. Precious metals just hit number one in IBD sector today. Oh, okay, which will likely stimulate more trade in gold stocks was last for most of past few years. Yeah, you know, it's kind of an interesting point. Not that you want to be bottom fishers or anything, but my first trip to Italy, uh, I guess in 2008, uh, I was at the Morningstar Industry Group's awards, and they were talking about uh, – they were giving these awards to all these people who bought energy stocks. <laughs> so – or 2007, I forget which one. Where remember, energy went up to like $200. A, uh, everybody's like, oh, let's go to $200 a barrel or whatever. And I'm like, well, I guarantee you won't see any of these guys appear next year. So, uh, yeah, markets go up and markets go down. So worst of last year will probably be uh, some of the better stocks this year. But you don't want to be a bottom fisher. Wait for them to hit bottom start going up. Yeah, I agree with you. Adobe looking like Amazon tech sector shorts of the week. Hey, absolutely. Adobe's on my list for today. All these big cap stocks, Adobe, um, I could name a handful more of them or quite a few more. But, yeah, that looks fantastic. I think it's uh, – otherwise it wouldn't be on my list. So, yeah, uh, it's kind of all over the place longer term, but it's, it's still a good chart. You're welcome, MK. Have a good day. PFE? <laughs> PFE. PFE needs Viagra. Very good. Ah, it's all over the place. Uh, and it's down towards uh, – yeah, it's just to, all over the place for me to get excited about that. All right, just a couple more in the lightning round. Uh, CDE, oops, is that on my Landry list? Well, we can't go to there. Forget about that. Forget that I said that. Thanks, Dave. Take it off. Great call today. Oh, you're welcome. All right, SSRI, that's going to be a mining stock, a silver stock in particular. Um, you know, again, we have this overhead supply problem. Yeah, this looks fantastic, but... I'd be giving you a high five maybe if we were just looking at this. You got the bow tie, you got the pullback, you got the major lows, all time lows maybe, but then you got all this overhead supply. So I mean, we've got our work cut out for us in these metals and mining, unfortunately, and that's gonna that's gonna kind of suck to put it nicely. So okay, I I'm gonna have to Peter. We'll we'll take care of you. You waited patiently, and then uh, we'll we'll probably shut that shut things down. No, too big of a gap to deal with. So. Um, Ideally, you want to be in, in before the gap, obviously, and a little bit thin. So, yeah, I would let that one go uh, based on the size of the gap. Well, look, I know we have a few unanswered here, but anything unanswered, feel free to shoot me an email, uh, and I'll be happy to get to it. Uh, Traders Expo, uh, this weekend, New York. So if you're in New York, Andre, I know you and I are talking already. Uh, anybody else wants to get together? I'm trying to juggle everything with um, – I have some international guests coming in. Uh, that I'm meeting with. Uh, I just found out this morning. Um, I have um, some business associates that uh, I'll be meeting with. So it's going to be kind of crazy. Plus, I'll have my family with me. So I'm going to try to juggle it all, make everybody happy. But uh, shoot me an email if you are in New York, you want to hook up. Uh, maybe we could just all get together and have a couple of beers or something. That would be fine with me. Um, but uh, please let me know if you do want to hook up. Be, uh, be happy to, um, to figure out a way to accommodate you. And we'd love to meet you. So uh, Traders Expo, it is free. It's in New York. It uh, starts on Sunday. So, And I'll be speaking Monday around 10 in the morning. I have some interviews later that day. So I will be at the show uh, some of Sunday and most of Monday. So I hope to see you there. Uh, if not, everybody have a great weekend. And any questions and answers, shoot me an email. And I guess we'll talk again next week. So you guys next week and girls. Thank you so much.